Welcome to the 19th Century Charitable Association in Oak Park, where it is our vision to be a dynamic cultural center for community learning. We have scheduled 30 programs this year as a part of our enrichment series, which fulfills our mission to strengthen our community through learning, giving, and sharing our landmark building. Today's program is Lost Civilizations, the World Before Patriarchy. I am so pleased to introduce our speaker, Nancy Wakarski, who received a PhD from the University of Chicago. She's the author of a three-book Chicago-based Gilded Age mystery series, which won the People's Choice Award, and which she came to discuss with us here back in 2005. Today, she's sharing the background of her newer eight-book series, which is also set in Chicago and the world. There's a lot of travel in this. It's an archaeology-themed mystery and adventure series with tones of Dan Brown, Indiana Jones, Harry Potter, and The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> Think we left out anything? <laughs> Nancy, did no, I leave out anything? You got it. <laughs> Books are available at Amazon and after the program during tea downstairs. So I'm very pleased to introduce Nancy or to reintroduce her to us. And Nancy, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, and I really appreciate the chance to discuss this particular topic that's so dear to my heart. So let's get started. Uh, here's a disclaimer to begin with. Patriarchy is kind of a dirty word, and it unfortunately is equated with, hmm, man bad, woman good. And I want to make it quite clear as we go forward in this conversation that there, it was a very small subset of predatory males that were really responsible for spreading the ideology of patriarchy around the planet. So uh, there will be no man bashing. Everybody feel comfortable. Any gentleman in the audience, you don't have to leave. I'm not going to be attacking you, okay? All right. Um, Deb has already done an able job of explaining who I am. Uh, as she said, University of Chicago PhD in literature, uh, 11 award-nominated best-selling historical mysteries at one point or another. Um, the Arcana is a seven-book series, but the spin-off, Trove Chronicles, I'm continuing the adventure because Every book gives me a chance to discuss archaeology, pre-patriarchal archaeology, on a different continent. And it existed, uh, matristic history existed everywhere, except Antarctica, because uh, the penguins were not too forthcoming about telling me what they were doing. <laughs> so the reason I'm, I'm establishing my cred up front here is that some of this theory may prove to be kind of... Um, if you haven't heard it before, it may seem really lunatic fringe, and I might seem like a candidate to live in a basement with a tinfoil hat. So I'm saying I'm a scholar. I've got my doctorate. I'm not crazy. My mother had me tested. So just whatever you hear today, just accept that I researched it thoroughly, and there is solid basis for the theory that I'm putting forth. So first of all, uh, this is what we'll be discussing today, what patriarchy is. And when I say, where on earth did it originate, that isn't just a, a figure of speech. There was a very specific place on earth where patriarchy came from, and it spread from one very precise point on the globe. And there was a whole lot that preceded it that was not patriarchal, that was matristic. So let's start with a definition. What is patriarchy? a system of society or government in which men hold political, religious, and economic power from which women are largely excluded. Now deal with this, deal with this visual for a minute. And I, I chose many of these visuals specifically because of their graphic impact. All the male figures are standing on the right. They're all armored. Uh, women on the left are kneeling, eyes downcast, not speaking. The guy in the middle, I assume, is mansplaining something, but he's, he's definitely on the other side. Uh, and really, that the gender imbalance that this represents is the essence of patriarchy. But it has some very specific characteristics that define it. And in a nutshell, only one. Uh, patriarchy, patriarchal cultures are geared toward continuous warfare. 
you, you don't see it so much now because patriarchy has been dimming for some time, but in its original state, it was intended to be a militaristic social organization. Uh, if you think about epic poetry, the Iliad, the Odyssey, anything from that period and, and sometime beyond, uh, everything was a glorification of battle exploits by one hero or another. The resources of a culture were funneled almost exclusively into chronic wars of unprovoked aggression because that was the way you got rich. You expanded your territories, you conquered somebody else, you enslaved those people, you exploited um, the lower classes, you definitely created a caste system. And um, the only way to keep that going onward was to continue to find new territories to conquer and exploit. And obviously, if you are geared toward militarism, Males are going to be overvalued because they are the combatants. They're the cannon fodder in the next war you want to launch. And generally speaking, female abduction became quite common during this period, so women were viewed as spoils of war, or at the very least, were only defined by their biological ability to crank out another generation of warriors, and female offspring were generally valued less. So these were a lot of the formative reasons why patriarchy became so gender imbalanced in the first place. And here's some food for thought from Helen Keller of all people. The inferiority of woman is man-made. And Helen Keller lived an extraordinary life by any standard, all the more so because she couldn't see and she couldn't hear. And if a woman who has those particular challenges to face can figure this out, then I think the rest of us need to have our eyes checked. So, here's the question. Did we evolve as a male-dominant species? And again, I chose this graphic deliberately because if you look at four of these five figures, they're obviously all male and they're obviously all carrying some kind of weapon. The second one from the left has a little rock. The one in the middle has a pointy rock, which is probably flint-napped. The one after that has a club and the guy on the end has a, a knife and probably a spear in his other hand. These are all indicative of a certain way of looking at human evolution as uh, competitive, aggressive, and certainly a lot conflict-laden. But the question is, is this true? Is this how we started out? Is this, is this essentially what human beings are? And as I look out at this sea of faces and the demographic of people in their golden years, you are gonna love this next slide. The grandmother hypothesis. It basically posits that the linchpin for human civilization is women of a certain age. Uh, it may come as a surprise to you to realize that there are only a handful of species on this planet that experience menopause, the female menopause. Uh, killer whales, pilot whales, and human females. No other primates, just human females. And, What's interesting about the parallel here between killer whales and humans is we have approximately the same lifespan, at least among females, 80 years. Uh, there's usually only one offspring produced at a time, and they're highly intelligent. They're actually members of the dolphin family, the largest members of the dolphin family, with the IQ of approximately a 14-year-old human. Not the 14-year-old who doesn't clean up his room and wrecks the family car. It's the 14-year-old honor student who is going to graduate and she will become a doctor someday, that 14-year-old. So this is what we're dealing with in terms of parallels, but the really most significant quality that scientists believe explains the phenomenon of menopause is a matrilineal social organization. Killer Whale Society is based on the matriline. It is um, a female, her offspring, their offspring, potentially their offspring, so she could be the mother, grandmother, great-grandmother of all her progeny. They all remain affiliated with her throughout life. The males, of course, will swim off and cavort sexually with females from other pods, but they return home, and that is their home. Offspring do not leave the kin group. The matriarch is the key to group survival because scientists have been following killer whale matrilines around for 40 years just to see what happens if a matriarch dies. Within the following 12-month period, it decreases her, um, her lineage's chance of survival by 30%. So the, the theory, the thinking, is that there's a trade-off between biological reproduction 
and the chance to ensure group survival by curtailing your own biological reproduction. Because think about it, a human female will spend a full third of her life not producing offspring. And for most species on the planet, the way it works is you're born, you reach puberty, you reproduce until your hormonal levels decline to the point you can't, and then you die. And that's true of all primate species as well, not humans. And there's a good reason for that because just, you know, Jane Goodall, it's great that she foregrounded a lot of attention to the chimpanzee, but they are not our closest primate relatives. All the attention went to the male-dominated chimps instead of to the matriarchal bonobos, who are our closest relatives. Uh, we, we share the same amount of DNA with chimps and bonobos, but physiologically, the most recent evidence is that we split off the bonobo line uh, much more recently. So theoretically, at least, human beings came from a primate group that was already matriarchal to begin with and has twice the lifespan of a bonobo, as living as long as a killer whale. Consequently, it made a lot more sense to have elder females who were responsible for the welfare and the well-being of all their progeny to look after them after not being burdened by their own biological reproduction. And so that's pretty much what we think happened. And here's another good quote for you. Uh, a purpose beyond reproduction. The heyday of woman's life is the shady side of 50. And this came from Elizabeth Cady Stanton. If you know who she is, she and Susan B. Anthony spearheaded the women's suffrage movement in this country. And she ought to know where she's, what she's talking about because she had seven children of her own before she really got rolling after the age of 50 and translated the woman's Bible and agitated for equal rights for women. But the reason why this is so um, anachronistic is that she lived during the Victorian age and historically throughout the period of patriarchy females are valued for their biological reproductive capacity and there are some cultures ancient cultures that really saw no value in a woman after after she hit menopause in um, in early Hinduism I mean there was obviously the practice of sati where a live widow flings herself on her husband's funeral pyre and burns alive. And in the West, of course, we invented witchcraft persecutions where you find all the widows and the spinsters and the odd people who had a lot of cats and lived outside of town, and you burn them as witches. Whole lot of burning of old women going on. And principally because patriarchy equates the female gender with biological reproduction. And this is a whole different way of looking at how human beings evolved and why they evolved. So here's a better visual. This is the parallel of the one I showed you a couple of minutes ago of, of Man the Conqueror with his club and his weapons. In this case, the two figures on the right are carrying pointy sticks, but they are not spears. They are not weapons for combat or aggression. Those are digging sticks that foragers use to gather root vegetables, insects, whatever you can scrounge under the ground. And in um, gatherer hunter societies, the foragers typically female, though not exclusively, we're producing 60 to 80% of uh, the food supply on a daily basis. Because hunting is an uncertain occupation, and if you listen to Desmond Morris and his old theory about the caveman going out and clubbing a mastodon and bringing it home, what were the females doing? Sitting around in a cave waiting for the steak to show up? No, they were, they were out traveling anywhere from five to eight miles a day foraging and successfully providing for their offspring and their offspring and their offspring. So here's the, here's the premise, and I'm going to read this because there's a syllogism here. Species evolve by selecting traits that offer the best chance of survival. Everybody knows that. But in a menopausal species, you are, it, it's a trade-off. You're limiting your own potential to create more of your own kind um, just to ensure group viability. But it's, this phenomenon is only going to develop in species where group survival depends on a senior female leader. So the ultimate question, if human groups evolved to be led by alpha males, would menopause matter? Not so much. It would be about as useful as a glass hammer, about as useful as a chocolate teapot, about as useful as a push-up bra on a bull. No use at all. 
no use at all. So that's why there is a very, there is very strong reason, compelling evidence to suggest that humans evolved as a matricentric species. And that being the case, here's a graph of what we looked like. The big purple bar on the left, 180,000 years of evolution, we would have been matricentric. The little blip on the right, 5,500 years, is the time during which we would have been patriarchal. Uh, now, there are those, uh, even in the 19th century, when the first theories that we evolved matricentrically were being posited, some Victorian gentlemen were saying, yes, yes, of course, but patriarchy represents a higher, higher level of evolution. We brought civilization to the world. We brought order. Um, no, not. I mean, I'm, as the slides that follow will show, that's just bunk, because there were plenty of sophisticated civilizations. And in fact, patriarchy represented a devolution from a previously more sophisticated state of human organization. So. The question is, why did humans switch to patriarchy? And there is kind of a hint in, in this graphic, but this one will make it a lot clearer. The role of the horse. Did, did anybody out there see Barbie? A show of hands? Yeah, and you liked it, right? You thought it was, it was a great movie? Um, I loved it too, and I wasn't even going to go, which is ironic, because in 1959, the year the stereotype Barbie came out, I was five years old. And my mother handed me this stick insect of a doll with a big chest. I didn't even ask for it. And I got, I got the stereotype Barbie in the chevron bathing suit. And within six months, I turned her into a weird Barbie. <laughs> if any of you have seen the movie, you know what that means. I'm not proud of myself, but I was five and I had issues I needed to work out. Um, so anyway, uh, what's fascinating to me about the movie is that um, it really does foreground. There is a very, very immediate correlation between the domestication of the horse and patriarchy. And initially, when, pa when Ken leaves Barbie world and goes to the real world and sees that men are treated with respect and they can pretty much do anything they want, he's just, he, he immediately fuses the notion of seeing men on horseback and men in big trucks. That's the other thing. And when he comes back to Barbie world, contrite, and he learns his lesson, he says, to be honest, when I found out that patriarchy wasn't about horses, I lost interest anyways. Except, except, it's all about the horses. Um, and this latter quote just tickles me no end because he's explaining to the other group of Kens who didn't leave, well, first I thought patriarchy was about men, and then I thought it was about horses, and then I realized it was just horses are men extenders. And they're all going, dude, yeah, that's the way it is. Um, but in point of fact, there is so much truth in that satire because that mattered more than anything else what horses were. It's no exaggeration to say they were the atom bomb of their age. Before humans had domesticated horses, we were crawling across the earth on foot, dragging things on, I don't know, makeshift pallets or, or pulling carts if you even had figured out how to use wheels. So bringing a horse into the mix, domesticating it, not just for carrying loads or traveling great distances, but weaponizing it for warfare. That's what made the difference. Horses equal power, and power corrupts. John Steinbeck uh, made this very complimentary quote about horsemen. A man on a horse is spiritually as well as physically bigger than a man on foot. He probably didn't recognize the downside of that statement. Bigger isn't necessarily better in this case. On the upside, when used for peaceful purposes, horses were a great improvement. Uh, the person who sat on horseback was physically elevated over everybody else, and you could see for miles and miles and miles. You could travel faster than you could on foot, you could haul far heavier loads, and you could expand your territorial range immensely, exponentially, if you had horses under your control. However, for some reason, uh, it went to their heads, and people who were sitting on horseback started to feel that they were superior to people who didn't have horses. Intertribal raiding became the principal male occupation, which was going to do something to erode the female power base. Women generally owned possessions, owned most of the property such as there was, and divided it up. But when men started bringing wealth into the tribe by raiding, I mean, this was a benefit to the tribe, so initially females in that group would have thought this is a good idea, but at the same time didn't realize that 
it was weakening the power of the clan mother because the war leader all of a sudden became way more important. Uh, murder, pillage, and female abduction became common. It, it's, you know, if you're out looking for a bride and you're on horseback, it's real easy to swoop into a village, grab a woman, and ride away before anybody can follow you on foot. So again, this horrifically enough was the beginning of the rape culture that everybody is complaining about. Well, they should complain about it now, but everybody is talking about now. This is where the seeds were planted for it. Uh, and the thing to stress about intertribal raiding was that most of it was not done out of necessity. It was done for prestige and wealth. Uh, men quickly discovered, men of a certain type, quickly discovered that they could elevate their status in the tribe, gain more influence, gain more wealth, if they were willing to go out there and risk their necks to steal it from somebody else. And it did elevate their status within the tribe, so they were getting a lot of social approval for doing this sort of thing. And in order to maintain that status, they had to go out and keep on conquering more and more and more, and that was the birth of toxic masculinity. If you're thinking that this is just a fanciful idea of mine, we have a historic parallel uh, quite recently in this country. In the 1700s, the Comanche tribe moved uh, to the plains because they knew that they could acquire horses from the Spaniards, either through theft or wild mustangs, just to build up herds. And these quotes from Britannica are kind of evocative of what the whole problem was. Before, before horses became available, intertribal warfare was relatively rare and few battles were deadly. Just about everybody was in the same boat. They were uh, relatively peaceful, certainly egalitarian, gatherer or hunter societies with a slight edge given to the females um, who most of them, if not all, were matricentric cultures. After the horse, the Comanche became, basically created an empire on the plains. Uh, the word Comanche is derived from a Ute word meaning anyone who wants to fight me all the time. And they did. They fought everybody. Now, you could make the argument that they were embattled, there were, col there were European colonists who were making inroads into their territory, but they took on everybody, not just the US cavalry, not just settlers. They were more focused on uh, conquering every neighboring tribe, and when they had conquered all of them, they expanded their territory outwards. The estimate at the end of the Comanche Empire was that they had enslaved 20,000 indigenous people, sold them into slavery in Mexico, and got the money to buy more horses, to buy more weapons, and on and on it went. So sadly, uh, the horse is power and power corrupts, and that seems to have happened. It's very important, though, to recognize you can't exploit the horse to its maximum capability unless you live in a certain kind of topography. And the American Plains were the perfect place for this. You, you were traveling immense distances and nothing was getting in your way. Uh, as patriarchy spread over the planet, even to this day, we find that there are pockets of mattress-centric culture that are on islands or mountainous regions or places where you can't fully exploit the value of the horse for riding in quickly, sweeping in, conquering, and leaving. So this is one of the reasons why the Comanche achieved such prominence. Geographically, they were positioned perfectly for it, and they were at a crisis point in their own culture because of the threat from um, European colonizers. So the horse itself was only domesticated in one little tiny place on this planet. And we'll get into how we know this specifically. But the area in question is the um, Caspian, Ponte Caspian Steppe. It's this area in purple. Um, I don't know if you can see the mouse pointer. Never mind. But what it constitutes is southern Russia and a little bit of eastern Ukraine. And it's just funny how history just keeps on repeating itself. Um, Yes, and specifically the area, the narrow, very narrow area between the Volga and the Don rivers, which is up hereabouts. So southern Russia for sure, uh, where the Yamnaya and before them um, the Sintashta culture uh, around 3500 BCE were seriously domesticating horses. There was, there was some evidence it could go as far back as 4200, but anthropo archaeologists aren't entirely sure because they can't tell if there's a bit wear pattern on the horses that would indicate they were ridden. 
uh, so we're not real sure of anything until 3500 BCE. But what we do know is once the horse was domesticated in this region, the practices and the characteristics of the tribes who lived here began to spread into other areas. And that became known as the Kurgan theory. Um, talk about the grandmother hypothesis. Deal with the lady on the left. This is Maria Gimbutas. Uh, she was a, an eminent professor for a quarter of a century at UCLA. And when she was going on archaeological digs in Eastern Europe, she started to notice something interesting about the burial practices. Prior to a certain point in time, all the burials she was finding would have been an elder female surrounded by her offspring, relatively um, equal in terms of how, bury, how people were buried, not a lot of significant grave goods, and a lot of votive uh, figurines indicating goddess worship, and relatively peaceful culture because nobody was dying from battle injuries. There were no fractured skulls, broken bones, nothing uh, to indicate that chronic warfare was part of their behavior. But all of a sudden, you'll see in the, in the picture on the right, that's what a kurgan is. A kurgan uh, is a Turkic word meaning burial mound uh, or barrow. And underneath that mound would, be, have, would have been buried a war chieftain, lots of human sacrifices, probably a lot of horse sacrifices, and lots and lots of grave goods, wealth, buried with this one individual. And you first find these in the area where horses were domesticated, but over the following 1,000 years, 2,000 years, you see them spreading to Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Western Europe, and beyond. You'll find Kurgan graves. And uh, Gimbutas posited that there was something very different about these people. They weren't at all like the groups that they had supplanted. So, Kurgan cultural char characteristics are very distinctive, and this goes back to what I just said about the horse and the effect it has on people who ride horses. The Kurgan, and when I say Kurgan culture, there are specific tribes associated with this. I, in my books, I call them the overlords, but essentially, this is just easier, I'm gonna call them Kurgans. They were patriarchal, they were aggressive, they were not farmers, they were not gatherer hunters, they were pastoral nomads, which means they had herds of cattle, herds of horses, you know, eventually sheep, goats, I guess, anything on the hoof that you could herd. They were the ones who domesticated horses first. They worshiped male war gods and not creation goddesses for obvious reasons because, um, I don't know if, I'm, if I mentioned this earlier that when it came to the Comanches, it took only three generations to turn them from a matricentric culture to a patriarchal one. So it didn't take very long once the Kurgans had domesticated horses to shift the balance of power from um, female uh, tribal or clan leaders to male war leaders. The tribes coalesced around authoritarian strongman rule. And as they moved outward, they migrated outward from their homeland, they used military force to conquer the more peaceful cultures that they met because these people were basically just minding their own business and really had no defenses in place because they didn't anticipate that somebody was gonna sweep in and try to conquer them. And so as these Kurgans became more successful at, at their raids and at ac acquiring territory and gathering wealth, they would hoard that wealth in elaborate graves for their chieftains. The best analogy that I can think of, think of all the B-grade biker movies that were made in the 1950s where you have 20 guys in Hell's Angels riding into town on their hogs and just intimidating a peaceful agricultural community of 1,000 or 2,000 people. And that would kind of be what was happening here. Because the earliest... Uh, arguments against the Kurgan theory said, well, where are all the bodies? I mean, if all these people were, were sweeping out of, out of the steppe region, why don't we see more signs of massacre? Because it took very few of them to dominate a whole lot of the rest of the people. And this is kind of how they did it. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know how many of you were aficionados of sci-fi fantasy movies in the 80s, but this handsome fellow is a character from the original Highlander movie. Uh, it's an actor named Clancy Brown playing a character named the Kurgan. And what I want to point to here is the headgear he's wearing. It's the skull of a carnivore, which becomes very important in terms of the apprenticeship that turned these guys into predators. 
there were rituals that would separate them from their families at the age of eight. They would have to go live rough in the wild. They might be allowed to have a dog or a wolf as a companion during the intervening seven years. When they returned, they were rough and tough and ready to become warriors at the age of 15. But at the winter solstice, there was one final rite of passage that was required. They had to slaughter the pet that had accompanied them and um, skin it, butcher it, eat its flesh, and wear its pelt. Um, yeah, this gives you some idea of the mindset of, of who these people were, what they were like. And initially, this was always viewed as a myth because it appears in all kinds of Eurasian mythology, this uh, winter solstice ritual of the dog sacrifice, until a few archaeologists actually found bones that corroborated it in the Volga region uh, around 2000 BCE. So think about the mindset of taking a, a boy at the age of eight and pretty much training him to become a killer. And interestingly enough, um, at the age of 15, they were turned loose on any other tribes to go out and pillage to their heart's contempt, heart's contempt, my contempt, heart's content. Um, they, uh, everything was fair game. They could kill, they could abduct, they could rape, they could steal. And as long as they brought it back to their home tribe, everybody was cool with that. Everybody was fine. But what happened around 3000 BCE is the steppes began to desiccate. Previous to that point, it had been a sea of grass. Uh, there were lots of lakes, lots of rivers, ideal for pasturing large, her large herds. Uh, starting as far back as 11,000 BCE, the global weather, I mean climate change obviously, not from fossil fuels, but global climate change nonetheless, raised ocean levels and desiccated large swaths of land. The Sahara wasn't a desert until 11,000. Uh, Saudi Arabia used to have irrigation canals at one point. North Africa wasn't desiccated. And eventually, the desiccation reached the Eurasian steppes. And at the point when it did, it put a strain on the steppe tribes that had horses. And been, there had been intertribal warfare going on and on and on for, I don't know, 500 years by this time. But the landscape could no longer support them. So there was a new practice that got started. They instructed these young men, these young predators, to go forth and pillage elsewhere. And again, this was initially thought of as a quaint, mytho quaint bit, bit of mythology. And this long, long quote that I've got here from Geoffrey of Monmouth about the history of the kings of Britain, I'll basically encapsulate what he's saying. King Vortigern was having a problem with some of his neighbors, so he hired some mercenaries from overseas, two brothers named Hengist and Horsa. And in Indo-European languages, hengist means stallion, horsa means horse. So clearly horse culture, these guys came from. And they explain that they had been banished from their own tribes because whenever the population got to be too big, uh, they would cast lots and figure out the, mo the hardiest and the most likely to survive. And they would send these young men off on horseback with their weapons, their war chariots, and say, go forth and pillage elsewhere, but don't ever come back. And that's exactly what they did. They pillaged their way across the globe. So this is what it looked like. The Kurgan eruption. Starting in 3000 BCE, as I said, there was desiccation in the steppes. More young men, these steppe predators, were being sent out. And over a period of time, they leapfrogged their way from one generation to the next across the entire continent. You can see the area in green in the middle is their homeland. That started around the, the outward, I don't want to call it a migration, eruptions started around 3000 BCE. It took them 600 years to make it to the British Isles, 700 years to make it to Spain. What this map doesn't show is that eventually they would continue from generation to, the gen to generation. They would settle down somewhere. They would establish themselves as the uh, top of the hierarchy, the warrior class that ruled everybody else. So they had conquered all the agriculturalists who were making them provide food, work for them. And from one generation to the next, whenever their population reached too great a number, they still followed the same practice of sending forth the most predatory young males uh, to go live elsewhere. And none of these males were traveling in family groups, which means they were abducting women as they went to set up their own families. 
if you could call it that. What this map doesn't show is that eventually the same ideology would spread into Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, Sumeria, North Africa, Scandinavia, uh, India, uh, the Persian plateau is already covered, that would eventually make its way to coastal China. And after the ideology had been fully adopted in China, the Chinese conquered the Koreans, the Koreans conquered the Japanese, and that's pretty much the global spread of uh, the ideology of patriarchy. And you might be wondering how 20 guys on horseback can do all of that. But their incursion tactics pretty much amounted to shock and awe. It would be a very small band, but they had superior weaponry, they had horses, they had wheeled war chariots, they had battle axes and spears, and they were far more, they weren't interested in slaughter so much as intimidation. So it's like a protection racket, actually. They'd come into a town, they'd intimidate the hell out of the local people until they were willing to cooperate with having these guys there because the notion was, well, we'll stay here and we'll protect you from anybody else bothering you. And that was, I don't know, the beginning of the mafia, if you want to consider it. Um, but it, uh, it resulted in a stratified social order with the warrior class on the top. They eventually evolved into the aristocracy and the crowned heads of Europe. That was the warrior class, it, the warrior caste in India the same. Below them, the priests, uh, the ideology that supported their conquest, and it was always true that the warrior caste and the priestly class worked hand in glove, and the peasants toiled for, for the upper two, for the benefit of the upper two. Again, this was big man rule, and it depended on chronic warfare in order to stabilize their position, protect it from any new eruptions coming out of the steppe, so that there was more warfare with other, other predators who were equally adept at weaponry. And it really solidified the notion of a peasant class that was defenseless against these battling feudal warlords. And lots of, lots of Kurgan grave goods involved, lots of monumental uh, funeral pyres. I mean, even the Egyptian pyramids, when you think about the number of grave goods that ended up there. And Egypt had been inf infiltrated by Kurgans because the, um, the ruling caste, the upper class, had brachiocephalic uh, skulls indicating alpine origins. Well, you know, not necessarily Swiss, but meaning that they were European as opposed to um, somewhere from further south in Africa. And if you're still doubting that a very small group of aggressive males can do this, we have a historical successor in 1521 when Cortez conquered Mexico City. There were 300,000 people living there at the time. Cortez arrived with 508 soldiers, 100 sailors, 16 horses, and 10 cannons. And that's pretty much what it took. Granted, he leveraged alliances with all the other tribes who didn't much like the idea of human sacrifice that the Aztecs were indulging in, so he had some more allies there. But it took very little to create a tipping point and pretty much change the ideology of an entire culture. Up until now, everything I've said is theoretical. And for the longest time, Maria Gambudis had a terrible time getting anybody to believe the Kurgan theory. Because initially it was like, where's all the slaughter? Where are all the bodies? If these people came in there, we should see more massacres. And she said, no, it was small roving bands of males on horseback. And they said, ho, 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 Maria, your grandmother, go sit in the corner. Nobody wants to listen to you. Uh, but now what we have is DNA evidence that proved her right. Uh, I don't know how conversant you are with how sophisticated DNA analysis has become in the last 20 years, but we can tell a great deal from an X and a Y chromosome. As you all know, females get two X chromosomes, one from your mother, one from your father, and a male gets an X and a Y, the X from his mother, the Y from his father. So Y chromosomes are particularly useful for understanding migration patterns among males. And this is where horses and humans collide. Uh, what does horse DNA have to do with human DNA? You'll see the parallel. And by the way, Ken was right. Centaurs. Horses are just men extenders. You see? He was right. OK, so let's start with the horse DNA. Uh, equine male horse DNA, stallion DNA, is really unique among all livestock because there is no variability in it. Most domesticated livestock 
has, they've been bred, they've been domesticated, strains have been perfected all around the planet. But among male domesticated horses, we can trace them back to a single source, two stallions in fact, from the Volga Don region of Russia. So we know that horses were domesticated here. However, female equine DNA is globally diverse. What that means is as these uh, male um, predators on horseback were expanding their territory, they would add to their herds by capturing wild mares and breeding them with tame Kurgan stallions. So that's the reason for the genetic variability among females and the lack of it among males. And until we had DNA evidence, everybody was claiming they domesticated horses. The Chinese say, said they domesticated. The Spanish said they domesticated it. No, it was the Russians. And just in a tiny, tiny geographical area. Now this next slide is way more disturbing than the fact that equine DNA is really just this specific. What you see in pink and in purple is the spread of uh, Kurgan male DNA across the planet. It was indigenous only to the pond to Caspian steppe. That little dot between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea is the only place it started. And this one only covers R1B, which is the most common haplogroup among um, Kurgan males. But R1A and I1 uh, would also have been equally prevalent. And if I couldn't find a map that could overlay all three of them, if I had, the areas in pink and purple would be a lot darker. But at this point in time, two thirds of European male DNA is now Kurgan. 90% of indigenous British male DNA is gone completely. But female DNA is indigenous in all cases. So I recently was watching a panel discussion among archaeologists who were, just, who were talking about this DNA evidence. And they said something like, one of them got kind of nervous and said, well, you know, we're going to have to talk about this at some point, about the implications that the female DNA is indigenous and the male DNA isn't. But nobody wants to touch that topic yet. But what we're talking about is coerced sex. We're talking about abduction and rape uh, as a basis for a happy marriage. And that that was the way the Kurgans propagated themselves with an indigenous female population. And if you doubt that, uh, African-American male DNA is 33% Caucasian. And the obvious, re and female DNA is indigenous African. And the reason for that is once again, you're talking about a population of females who really can't say no. Uh, so that's the best explanation for why, why we got there. And it had profound changes for, uh, for human beings culturally. Remember, we started out as a matricentric species egalitarian, there was no gender imbalance. People pretty much could occupy whatever roles they wanted. If a woman wanted to be a hunter, she became a hunter. Man wanted to be a forager, he did that. But Kurgan's had a highly stratified society. It was a vertical power structure, the aristocracy on the top, the peasants on the bottom, and rigid class uh, delineation. So you really couldn't rise from one class to the next. Even, a, up until quite recently in Europe, you were told to keep to your station in life. Your station, you, you just didn't go anywhere else. America is an anomaly in the sense that we say people can move as far as they want to. Chronic warfare, a, a militarized culture requires that that amount of uh, conquest would continue. And once they ran out of land, and I think part of the reason that the DNA uh, signature is so heavy in Britain, that represented a blind alley. Because Kurgans were averse to water either for personal hygiene or for sailing. They just couldn't go any further than Britain, and so what they had to do was turn back and start fighting each other, uh, turf battles to carve up more and more and more of the landscape for themselves. But again, their ideology required constant conquest. You either had to find a new territory or you had to steal somebody else's territory nearby to in increase your wealth, systemic greed. Uh, you could only raise your station, you could only um, have more influence, rise in the hierarchy if you were rich, and you could only get rich by thieving something from somebody else. And 
in the cases where you found new territory to conquer, you were going to exploit that population uh, through slavery. So colonialism and the slave economy, that also fueled Kurgan culture. And of course, last but not least, female subjugation, because you, a male needed to pass on all those ill-gotten goods to his next male offspring, and in order to do that, you had to control female reproductive power. It became an obsession. So that really lowered females pretty much to the point where they were two-legged livestock. They were walking uteri. And every, most of the laws were geared toward keeping them that way, uh, lim limiting education, lim limiting any kind of economic opportunities. They were supposed to stay home and be domestic breed animals. But there was a whole lot that was here before that happened. Now that I've depressed you all thoroughly about this, we're going to get to the better part. We're going to get to the, the uplifting part of this talk. And I'll talk fast, because I know I've only got 15 minutes left, and I can talk fast. All right, lost civilizations. And they were civilizations, and they existed well before patriarchy ever reared its ugly head. The figure on the right is Ishtar. She was a Babylonian goddess, but her predecessor had been Inanna in Sumer, which was a pre-Kurgan civilization. The interesting thing is that she's, she's weaponized. She's got weapons. Um, she's wearing her weapons, and she has a lion on a leash. The lady and the lion is an image, a votive image, that goes back to the Paleolithic. There are paintings. There are bas reliefs of goddesses either flanked by one or two lions. Sibylle in Anatolia, the great goddess, sits in a chariot drawn by two lions. Freya in Scandinavia uh, rides a chariot pulled by two fierce cats. So there's something about this iconography that goes very, very, very far back in the human psyche. But as far as what civilizations were here, let's start with Anatolia, Turkey. Uh, Cattle Hoyek was uh, had a peak population of 10,000 people in 6500 BCE. And this is an artist's representation because there's very little left at the site now. But they were built, the buildings on the left, you can see they're built very close together. There are no streets. That's because everybody traveled by rooftop. You can see the ladders leading up to the roofs. So there was, that was how you moved around. But on the right, you can see that there's a fairly segmented use of space here. And the most interesting feature is what's in the subfloor. Those are bones, and in the, in the, you can see the bottom part of that image. It's like a John Wayne Gacy burial, only not. Um, this was where the bones of the ancestor would have been buried under the house, uh, the eldest female ancestor, to protect everybody living in that unit because they were all her offspring. And again, plenty of evidence of goddess worship here. Vinca culture in Serbia. What you're seeing aren't just scratchings on stone. They are the earliest indication that we have so far of any kind of writing, uh, ancient script. And this predates the Sumerian cuneiform by a 1,000 years. And all the ritual objects found here were uh, goddess worship. But we get into things that are far more sophisticated than that with Sumer. Uh, 4,000 was. This was the Uruk period, the earliest period in Sumeria where they had a sophisticated civilization before the Kurgans arrived, before Gilgamesh arrived and their ilk, and the warring city-states period. A population of 90,000 in this town. At the time, it was the largest urban area in the world. They had a canal system, advances in technology, astronomy, agriculture. Their principal goddess was Inanna, and she is credited as the inventor of writing. Well, she didn't know anything about the Vinca, but still. You know, I'll, I'll give her credit for it. The city, um, in this artist's representation, there really are, it's not heavily fortified because they weren't fighting anybody at that point. But as more Kurgans infiltrated the area, and Gilgamesh was a culture hero of the Kurgans, he got the bright idea of building city walls around 2700 BCE, which would have correlated with the first inroads of Kurgans into Mesopotamia. Oops, skipped one. Uh, the Indus Valley civilization is really interesting. Mohenjo-daro in 2500 BCE was fairly spectacular. It had a population of 40,000, wells, drainage, bathing systems, um, part of a planned urban construction. They had an observatory, and they used calendar stones to try and figure out what their planting cycles were, fairly sophisticated astronomical observations. 
mother goddess artifacts found everywhere, no indication of warfare, not fortified for defense. And the wall that you see in the lower right corner, when archaeologists first saw this, they went, aha, this is proof that they had to fortify. No, it proved that during the monsoon season, they needed a retaining wall against the floodwaters from the Indus River. So that's the only reason that was there. And this, this site was not really, it was taken over by Kurgans after it had been abandoned because desiccation also hit this region. So by 2500 BCE, it peaked. And by the time the Kurgans arrived in 1000, 1500 years later, there wasn't too much left of it. Oops. Crete was, is probably the best known remaining example of uh, matristic culture. Uh, it was an island, which is one of the reasons why it took the, the Kurgans so long to get there. Europe's oldest city uh, with a population of 100,000 at its peak. Aqueducts uh, through gravity feed in the town, three separate water management systems, and the first known water flushing latrine. I'm fixated on the plumbing, you can tell this. But the reason for that is that level of urban planning indicates a high level of organization. and for the longest time, patriarchy was, said, was saying that, well, we brought cities and urban planning and aqueducts in Rome. No, you didn't. It was there a whole lot earlier than that. And Minoan Crete, 1500 was the beginning of the end. They had been flourishing for 1500 years before that. But uh, between palace fires and the tidal waves after, um, after the earthquake on, what was it, uh, on Thera, uh, they, that sort of ruined the population and made them easy prey for the Dorians. But again, Knossos was not built on a hilltop. This is built in a valley uh, for votive reasons, and it was not planned and built with fortifications of any kind. It's called a palace if you go and visit Crete, but that's not what it was. It was sort of an urban administrative center. So again, not warfare. And this one I'm just throwing in for fun, the Meroe pyramids uh, in uh, Kush, which is modern day Sudan, Nubia. Uh, for the longest time, they were ruled, they were matrilineal all the way through the um, Egypt's pharaonic period and actually conquered Egypt in the 8th century BCE. And the uh, stele on the right, the image on the right is uh, a kandake, a ruling queen. The Romans, when they first came through there, they didn't know what to make of these ladies and they thought their names were all Candace. So that's where the name Candace comes from, because they would call them a Candace, but it was a Kandake, and she was a queen, and she could trounce you if she wanted to. Now, uh, surviving matristic, matricentric cultures all over the planet, usually in I regionally isolated areas that would have been hard to conquer. Uh, in Africa, sub -Sah in Saharan Africa, the Tuareg. And what's really crazy about this, the figure on the right in blue is a man, figure on the left in black is, uh, is a woman, but they converted to Islam some time ago, not at the point of a sword, but through some peaceful Arab traders. And because of their, and I would call it matriarchal culture, the men took on the veil. Men wear the veil and women don't. So, you know, they were, they were going to oblige the rules, but they were just gonna bend them a little. Uh, the, the second image is an Iroquois longhouse in North America where, uh, again, a clan mother would live with all her offspring, though if, one of her children got married, the husband would come to live in her lodge, but divorce was a much easier business because if the wife was dissatisfied with her husband, she'd pack up his belongings, set him outside the door, and he had to go home to mama because that was divorce. It was plain and simple, no fault. Your fault, go away. <laughs> uh, and really, Iroquois culture survived until the inroad of uh, French missionaries and that really weakened the clan structure, the role of the clan mother, and at that point, the, converting them to Christianity also elevated patriarchy in the minds of the people, and that sort of was the beginning of the end of the Iroquois. The Mazuo still exist as a matriarchal culture in China, and geographically, again, they represent an area that would have been hard to conquer. They are in a very mountainous region of southwestern China. And it, it's a big tourist draw in China. They call it, what is it, the, the land of the women or the empire of the women. They have what's called walking marriage there. Not like walking, but pneumonia. You, um, if a couple likes each other, when a girl reaches the point in time where she decides she wants a boyfriend, she's given a separate room in the family compound and she invites him to spend the night. 
and they may have a very long-term ongoing relationship, and, but it's a walking marriage because in the morning he walks back to his mother's house and he stays there. So, and it still exists. It's still going on. Um, and Sumatra, the Minangkabau. Boy, when I was writing the book about this one, the typos on this name alone got me. Uh, it's on the island of Sumatra. It's in Sumatra. And what you see again is sort of uh, comparable to the Iroquois longhouse. This house would be an ancestral residence where everybody in the extended family lives. And it is still considered the last true matriarchy on the planet. These people also converted to Islam, and it wasn't a military conquest. It was, again, a case of uh, trading with friendly Arabs and being influenced by their ideology and going, huh, this is OK. So the women wear, um, do wear headscarves, but they are still pretty much in charge of everything. So where do we go from here? I mean. Looking forward, what comes next? Patriarchy was a very long course of devolution, but I have every reason to be hopeful that it is in its last stages. And I chose these three images very specifically. On, in the lower left, you see smiling little girls in a developing country going to school. This would not have been allowed up until a couple of hundred years ago. Unheard of, still unheard of in some parts of the planet, but progress is being made. The upper right image is uh, global internet connectivity, because as much as authoritarian governments try to suppress information, you can't really keep the signal from getting through somehow. And human curiosity causes people who are living in repressive, under repressive regimes to look at what else is out there, and they usually find a way to get that information. And the lower right, just the sheer mass of technological innovation that we have been living with really for the last 200 years has rendered the horse obsolete. If you think about it, patriarchy, it, and if, if somebody were to ask me what's changed since 3000 BCE, up until maybe 300 years ago, not a whole heck of a lot. Uh, chronic warfare was still typical. Hierarchical aristocratic societies were typical. Monarchies were typical. But with the Industrial Revolution and the American Revolution and the French Revolution and the Chinese Revolution and the Russian Revolution and on and on, all of a sudden, uh, crowned heads were being toppled everywhere and innovation and technology were really making it, the horse was no longer of any kind of tactical advantage to anybody. So what do we got going for us now? Welcome to the information age. We have uh, supplanted monarchy with democracy. And among developed country, in developed countries, global gender parity in governing bodies is anticipated in 30 years. Trade has supplanted conquest for economic growth, and it's been proven that there's a higher standard of living in female-led countries. Everybody benefits with higher input from females in government. Education, especially education for girls, is more freely accessible than it has ever been at any point in history. Um, in the next 10 years, uh, there will be more graduates from medical school, uh, law school, and the STEM fields who are female. So they will be the majority in all of those. Telecom links have made it possible to create virtual communities, not the people you're arguing with in your local chat room, but actual virtual communities that can coalesce and, and create some good. It's, and because patriarchy has always flourished under a divide and conquer, scenario and limiting people's access to information and to other choices, it becomes harder to isolate and subordinate population groups when you have all, this, all these telecommunication methods flying around. See, there's one right now. Um, and last of all, solidarity. Uh, global coalitions form because we are communicating with each other, even though it can be annoyingly intrusive at times that we, you know, uh, with uh, social media, everybody telling everything they're doing every five minutes, but it does serve a positive purpose in things like Me Too, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. Those are all good things because patriarchy can only last as long as it's, a, it's an us-them scenario where the people at the top say, if you want to get to the top, you have to be like us, as opposed to everybody else going, hey, I think we can form coalitions without you, and we don't really need you anymore. So inclusion replaces hierarchical exclusion. So in conclusion, I'm going to leave you with this quote from uh, Beyond Barbarism. Leon Bourgeois in 1920 won the Nobel Peace Prize. And he says, 
the rise of man from the animal to the human level was prolonged by the necessity of rising from a state of barbarism and violence to one of order and peace. And history is a myth that men agree to believe, so we're changing the story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. We're going to take about five minutes of questions, and if anyone has more questions, uh, you can catch up with Nancy downstairs at T. So are there any questions? Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Gosh, a lot of new information there, but you know, I've recently been inspired by Richard Wrangham's, you know, the Harvard professor, the anthropologist book called The, the Human Paradox that you know, has a very different perspective on this human history than you're presenting today. Mm -hmm. But in particular, you know, with the uh, onset of the farming age after the end of the last ice age, it's mm -hmm. really hierarchy, hier hierarchical values that were driving culture and society rather than patriarchy versus... Uh, um, well, the and, other thing uh, to consider... Oh, I'm sorry, more about the uh, you know, hierarchical perspective, which is kind of standard thinking in the field. Uh, my own theory about, and yes, I've heard the theory that agriculture uh, really led to male domination, to hierarchy, to more structured societies, but I think it was concurrent with the development of the, the incursion, the eruption of the battle axe culture. So it, there may have been some nascent hierarchy going on at that point, but I think the tipping point was much more likely to be an incursion of a warrior class who said, and what was happening too among the agriculturalists, after a couple of generations, they thought that was the cool new thing um, to behave the way the upper class was behaving, and they started to mimic that in their own behavior in agricultural communities and peasant communities too, eventually. So. I think the two bounced off of each other as opposed to two completely separate theories. Okay, is there another question? Not really a question, just a comment. I'm an anthropologist and you were spot on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, that is so gratifying for me to hear because I'm an outsider in the field and I've only done this because I love research and I, I, I'm a scholar and I'm a researcher, but anthropology is not my field, so Intuitively, it felt right to me. Thank you for the validation. How does religion play into all of this? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> um, patriarchal religion has been the single most significant factor in reinforcing and reifying patriarchy. Uh, and it's true not just of the, the Abrahamic religions. It's also true in Hinduism and in Islam and in Buddhism because all of those evolved during the heyday of uh, patriarchy. So yeah, it's, it's really a fiercely fought battle right now to think of a substitute ideology that doesn't diminish women. You said that in the past there was continuous warfare, although we don't have warfare with guns and spears. Uh, I would contend as somebody who owned a middle-sized business that there's still <laughs> continuous warfare. It's just uh, my business trying to put your business out of business, and et cetera. And it's to, mostly men, but there are certainly w more and more women owning yeah. businesses. But I, it's, it's still, to me, a type of warfare. <laughs> uh, and you're not wrong, because human nature is human nature. And my thought is that there will always be a subset of people who are who really live by uh, the concept of scarcity, uh, scarcity mentality. There isn't enough to go around and you have to compete in order to succeed. And the matristic cultures emphasize collaboration, cooperation and support, but that doesn't mean that it was Woodstock there every day. Uh, I'd say probably about 30% of the population at any given point in time would be likely to ascribe to the opposite view that you gotta get all you can, it's dog eat dog. And I, I don't know that I have a solution for that, except to say that the majority for a change don't quite agree with that. I, I mean, if you look at mass movements now, there's much, more, there's much less of a tendency to condone that as the ideal of how people should behave. But it's out there. 
Your lecture is interesting. I'm a former U.S. Army officer and a combat veteran. Mm -hmm. And I bring this up because a woman, Lisa Marchetti, was just appointed the head of the United States Navy. She's a full four-star admiral, and so the head of the Navy is now a woman, and there are women generals as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the other thing you brought up about horses is I don't like horseback riding, but the planet, whether it was thousands of years ago or now, is mostly water covered, and it is seaborne that many of the countries were founded and many of the wars were fought by seaborne troops. And Hitler was a soldier in World War I. Mm -hmm. If he had known more about the Navy, the British were instrumental in defeating Hitler along with Americans because he allowed the Mediterranean to be taken over by allied troops in the in naval forces. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out here with a woman admiral and other women in, in military occupations. Yeah, I think it, it was difficult for the military for the longest time. And, you know, I'm not negating the necessity to have a, a natural armed services, national armed services, because we are at a point in history where you can't really be naive enough to think, oh, well, if, you know, let's have a love in. That's not going to work. Uh, but I don't disagree that eventually navies became pivotal. That was at a more sophisticated stage years and years and years after the Kurgan Rough Riders came out of the steppes. And warfare developed on every, in every theater that it could. And that became definitive. The British Navy, the Spanish Armada, uh, yeah. So I don't disagree with anything you're saying, and I, I would be curious to see how leadership of, of the um, services on the seas would be different under female control, command. Do you see AI um, continuing um, affecting patriarchy or, or helping women at all? Have you studied AI at all? Uh, well, I, I'm very concerned about AI as a writer. Obviously, that's something that worries me quite a lot. As, well, as a ghost writer, anyway, it does. Um, I haven't really thought about the implications. I, though technology has always been a little bit more of a level playing field for uh, female developers. I was in tech for 20 years, and it wasn't that much of a... Um, I don't really... I never really thought of it as a male-dominated field. So I don't know what the implication would be for women's liberty or uh, any limitation of opportunity for them in the future. That's something I'll have to give some thought to. OK, we're going to take just one more question. I was wondering, in Kurgan culture, how is it that the males came to uh, gain control of the horses and not the women, if it was a matriarchal society? In in pure, in pure Kurgan culture, they didn't. There were an awful lot of war leaders who were female. Uh, in step, on, step anthropology, they have found evidence of that all over the place. I think what I failed to emphasize, and I should have, is that patriarchy really got ossified after the eruption, because you're talking about traveling bands of males, unattached males who are conquering a female population and abducting and marrying them, so that subordinated them. But within the step culture itself, it wasn't quite as cut and dried. Um, as a matter of fact, there's, a, there's an interesting case in China where they excavated a body with lavish grave goods, and they were calling it the golden man. They had him all in his armor. Well, the grave goods would indicate that this was a female war leader. So, yeah, there, and actually the whole notion of Amazons probably originated among female step warriors. Yes, they definitely existed. It was the ones who left that area over the following thousand or two thousand years that really, really nailed it for patriarchy. Okay, thank you so much for coming back to see us, Nancy. Thank you. <laughs>